Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, hello to everybody. Sorry if I too can take the things too formal uh, in this afternoon. Uh, and even if I would be too political uh, compared to a bit more cultural issues they were presented, for example, uh, to you today. First of all, I would like to say thank you for the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy for the invitation. I'm honored for the possibility to be here and uh, to be able to hold this speech. And, uh, and secondly, I would like to also excuse myself partially. Uh, I am not a specialist of, uh, of cultural diplomacy in the wider sense of the word. And uh, thus I will focus on a, on a perhaps somehow narrow spectrum of it, uh, leaving uh, many and sure important part of, uh, and other dimensions out of the consideration. In my interpretation, sorry, it's a bit too low for me. Uh, in my interpretation, cultural diplomacy is a soft power measure and uh, thus in some extent also part of a country's foreign policy. Self-evidently, cultural diplomacy has its own and independent goals. So for example, the cultural dimension of the official German foreign politics has to serve, for example, the worldwide support of the learning of German language, the support of German schools abroad, the academic and scientific exchange, intercultural dialogue, and last, last but not least, the preservation of cultural heritage and the promotion of the German culture abroad. However, on the other hand, the cultural diplomacy not only pursues these goals, but being part of the country's public diplomacy, it also contributes to a broader and more general ambitions and targets of the foreign policy, even in the case of Germany. Underlying only one important aspect, it can, hap it can happen, for example, through the support of civil society and through other democratic capacity building measures. Nevertheless, these measures are not exclusively implemented for their own sake or to have a, a more happy or a more peaceful world, but partially also to, to have a more stable, more democratic, more open, more transparent, and first of all, more predictable countries and societies in the neighborhood, which is without any question a security issue too. To have countries both in the imminent neighborhood of Germany, so within the EU, and to this point I would like to come back later, but also in the neighborhood of the European Union, and last but not least, globally too. And this way, these measures serve the most strategic and most important security interest of Germany too. If German cultural diplomacy is put under the microscope, then uh, two general characteristics of it can be identified. First and foremost, it's perhaps the, the most generous public and or cultural diplomacy system in Europe, spending, for example, the most money for the above mentioned democratic capacity building purposes compared, for example, with similar activities of France or the United Kingdom. Noseworthy, it happens in a well-coordinated concert of public and private actors working alongside of harmonized guidelines and common goals. Thus, if we would like to specify the most distinguished organizations and projects of German cultural diplomacy, then beside the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAAD, or the Federal Agency of Civic Education, the BPB, or the International Parliamentary Scholarship of the German Bundestag, also the political foundations of the German parties have to be mentioned as, uh, as one of the most important actors of donors of German cultural and public diplomacy, especially abroad. And last but not least, we cannot overlook the bunch of private foundations active in this field, like the Bosch, Herti, Humboldt, Thyssen, Volkswagen, and Henkel foundations, only mentioning the most important ones and excusing myself from dues I forget to note. Self-evidently, all of these foundations have individual priorities. Some are more active in pure scientific or cultural exchange. Others are more involved in democratic capacity building. However, they constitute an organic and inseparable part of German cultural diplomacy, both from the perspective of founding and project management. Thus, in nutshell, Germany has one of the most generous, good structured and coordinated cultural diplomacy, especially in the field of democratic capacity building. And later, we will come back to the question how effective it is. The second structural characteristic makes German cultural diplomacy unique in a European comparison. Self-evidently, any country has to reshape from time to time its public diplomacy, especially concerning its goals and funding. 
from the perspective of the country's international embeddedness, for example, from the economic possibilities, foreign policy goal, and so on and so on. And from this angle, compared to other traditional great powers uh, of cultural diplomacy in Europe, like France and the UK again, Germany has unique characteristics and possibilities. Meanwhile, meanwhile th these countries have to fit their cultural and or public diplomacy to a political and financial environment characterized by losing economic weight and the decline of political influence both in the European Union and globally. Germany, in contrary to that, has to reshape the goals and fundings of its cultural diplomacy in a way which is appropriate to the role of the economic and political leading power within the European Union. After the short introduction and overview, the question can arise how successful could or can German cultural diplomacy contribute to the goals of the country's foreign policy? How effective is it in its supportive role? Instead of, my answer, instead of an answer on my own, uh, I would like to refer to a discursive line present for many years in German foreign politics, which I will call as the realist challenge. This discourse focuses on the reform of German foreign policy and its representative state that Germany, a leading power in the EU with growing political influence, shall make a turn away from the value-based foreign policy into the direction of a more interest-based one. And parallel with this, the country's foreign policy elite should rethink its former value-based foreign policy goals and methods, inclusive public and cultural diplomacy, for example, and develop more hard power capabilities to represent and realize German interests. The debates have been running for many years and my personal opinion is that this realist challenge approach is, is wrong. However, it is not wrong because of its goals. I also share the opinion that Germany should overtake more responsibility in the international politics and consequence of its above explained changing position and self-evidently shall develop the appropriate and currently objectively missing hard power capacities and resources to be able to fulfill the country's new international role and responsibilities. The discourse of the realist challenge is wrong as a consequence of its argumentation and because of the fact that it often interprets interests and values as as mutually opposing phenomena. The determination of the content, what is national interest, is, uh, is never a recognition of a simple evidence, but a very complex, manifold process among many players, and not without, but, but with a lot of self-evident antagonism. Once an American diplomat told me that, that the US is a real global power, so it's extremely hard to harmonize U.S. interests with U.S. interests. And uh, the same phenomenon could be experienced from day to day in the early phase of the Ukrainian crisis, when it was really hard, and I think it's partially still is, to harmonize German interests with German interests. And under such circumstances, to have a, a stable value fundament to the determination of the most strategic level of interests in the foreign policy is inevitable. However, I am pretty sure that the value and soft power based German foreign policy with a very extensive cultural and public diplomacy environment and background can serve the most important strategic security interest of Germany the best in the long term. And therefore, if some members of German foreign policy elites, like the representatives of the realist challenge approach uh, or realist challenge discourse state, that the soft power based German foreign policy understand inclusive German cultural and public uh, diplomacy was not, success, was not success, successful enough in the securing of German interest, then the reason of this failure can be found, at least in my eyes, not necessarily in the principle of fundaments but in the practical implementation. And uh, connected to this point, as a policy analyst, I would like to formulate two policy recommendations for the future. One do and one don't. The do would be 
what I could frame as a, as a more intensive utilizing of, of public, policy, public policy and public diplomacy networks. As I mentioned, German culture and public diplomacy comprises a lot of different scholarship and human capacity building projects. If I would be rude, then I could state that these projects, and I participated in some of them, uh, are implemented with the following logic. You come to Germany for six months, for a year or two, you will learn a lot and you will be affiliated with the German uh, democratic political culture. Then you will go home and, you, you, and because you will be sure member uh, of your national elites uh, or the elite of your country, based on the knowledge and social knowledge you gathered, you will be able to change the world at home on some way. So let's be honest, it's a very naive way of thinking. Uh, and if it's combined only with probably one annual alumni meeting as a follow-up measure, then these are really very expensive, but not necessarily very effective public and cultural diplomacy projects. I never saw any study about the multiplicative effect of such or similar programs, neither about the sustainability of such networks. Perhaps it's only my fault. Nevertheless, on the other hand, I strongly believe that cultural diplomacy shall not be guided by altruism. And if it is really a tool of soft power, then policy planners should start to give thought on that, how could German foreign policy, economic and public diplomacy, effecti uh, effectively utilize those networks and make more imminent advantage of them. More advantage of networks which are generated and financed from year to year by German cultural diplomacy itself. Currently, these networks remain underutilized in a great scale, and thus an asset is created in which it's permanently invested, but the investments are never really capitalized. The strengthening of follow-up, long-term resource sharing, and, uh, and the sustainable network creation and management would be required. And sure, further resources for these aims, as the existing project management structures are often overburdened with their actual tasks. And finally, about the don't. No, there is never a mission accomplished in cultural diplomacy. Self-evidently, public diplomacy programs are deeply influenced by the political business cycle. New regions, new issues attract attention. M meanwhile, old priorities became downgraded and diminished slowly. It is a natural process catalyzed by the financial limits of cultural diplomacy actors too, which press the actors always into the direction of intensive prioritizing. The EU Eastern enlargement, the color revolutions, or the Arab Springs earmark important swifts and reprioritizing in the European and German cultural diplomacy agenda, especially on the field of democratic capacity building measures. Unfortunately, the changes in the social attitudes and in the political culture are much slower than how the new waves of democratization are following each other and how resources are reprioritized from a geopolitical target group to another one. It was also a huge failure to believe that East Central European societies will own stable democratic political culture from one day to another only because they joined the European Union. Nearly all East Central European new EU member states have had their democratic failure periods since 2004. And present days, there is a new general threat in the region in the form of a phenomenon which is called new populism by the famous Polish political thinker Adam Michnik. Self-evidently, new populism does not have its home only in East Central Europe. It's currently also very influential in France or the UK, not to speak about its traditional presence uh, in Italy. But as German cultural and public diplomacy has, has no chance to influence any internal political processes in the UK or France, at least it could be tried in East Central Europe. At least with the aim of being able to avoid the most negative scenarios. However, the European Union co-shapes the rules of geopolitics, but it cannot absolutely suspend its effect. Geopolitics exists both within the European Union and alongside its borders. 
And the leading power of the East Central European region is, is definitely Germany. With a very old geopolitical terminology, East Central Europe belongs to the German sphere of influence. Germany was able to integrate the countries of the region very effectively in economic terms. The level of this integration can be surprising even for German foreign policymakers. The so-called Visegrad countries, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary together, are far greater and far more important trade and FDI partners for Germany than Russia is. Poland alone has a greater share in the foreign trade of Germany than Russia. However, on the other hand, the political integration of these countries in the form of sustainable and stable liberal democracies has been far less successful than the economic integration. Hungary is the best example for a kind of democratic breakdown since 2010. But I could also mention Romania, Poland between 2005 and 8, or Slovakia between 2006 and 10. And German foreign policy makers think it wrong when they believe that these democratic breakdowns are not their problem too. The above mentioned countries belong to the direct geopolitical environment and neighborhood of Germany, with a very important economic ties to it, and if any political turmoil or unwanted political developments will take place in these countries, Germany will be always among the first who will be affected. To summarize this point, East Central Europe is not and cannot be a mission accomplished area for German cultural and public diplomacy. In my eyes, it would be necessary to upgrade the priority level of this region, turn back the attention of German cultural and public diplomacy to it, and channel again democratic capacity building projects and resources here to be able to counteract uh, the growing threat of new populism. If new populism will be able to undermine the quality of democratic rule of law and human rights standards in EU member states, both the credibility of the whole European cultural and public diplomacy, as well as the strengths of European soft power will be weaker, inclusive the German ones too. A possible tendency, hopefully not accepted by Germany. And uh, after the do and don't recommendations, finally, I would like to summarize my points again only in one phrase. It is high time to establish or re-establish the category of interest in the German cultural and public diplomacy. Mostly with the aim that the most important things, the value base and the soft power methodology of German foreign policy can be safeguarded against a realist challenge. So thank you very much for your attention and if you have any question, I will be glad to try to answer them. Thank, Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I was just wondering what exactly you had in mind as democratic breakdown in Slovakia in 2006 and 2010. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think let's be objective. I'm a Hungarian one and I started the phrase with that the most serious democratic breakdown happened in Hungary after 2010. Perhaps it's also or only a, a question of thresholds. How do you identify a democratic breakdown? To be honest and, and objective, not to speak about my opinion, there were only four cases in the history of European integration since 2000, when, uh, when the use of the so-called Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union, at least what discussed, and the Slovakian case between 2006 and 2010, when, uh, when the Social Democratic Smer Party made a political coalition with uh, the Slovak National Party, we can open a debate about, but generally accepted a, a national radical party in the country, then, uh, then it was interpreted in the European Union as at least a possible source of, of danger for the democratic values. And as we know, some sanctions have taken place, as for example, the membership of Smer in the European Socialist Party was suspended for one year. So it was a similar political phenomena like in 2000 in the case of Austria, 
when, uh, when people parties made political coalitions and businesses with parties who were treated or categorized as radical nationalist far right wing parties. And it's not my it's not my analysis about the situation, but I would say the European reactions that time on this fact. And self-evidently, because there was this political coalition, only with one phrase, there was a, a European interpretation that the level of minority rights are endangered in Slovakia. I, I hope I could answer your question in a very diplomatic way. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very fruitful and very interesting. Um, my question would be, I'm just going to give you a little background of the question. Uh, while having a class of uh, foreign policy or foreign uh, policy of the United States, uh, there has been a debate about how we would we define democracy. And after uh, quite some time, it was very difficult for students to, uh, let's say, to agree upon, uh, uh, let's say, a definition of what democracy is. So I raised my hand and I asked the professor, I said, it's very difficult to find a definition of what democracy is. So the professor looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Sufyan, we might not know what democracy is, but we definitely know what democracy is not. So my question to you is, what is the definition you have used or the interpretation that you have given, of course, based on your research to democratic capacity building? What is your uh, personal or your own interpretation of that term? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I do not know how much time I have to answer it. Um, it's a very, very good question because it uh, opens a lot of different discourses. Whether, for example, the democracy which is promoted by Western or European or EU actors should be necessarily a Western model of liberal democracy or not? I cannot answer this question. Uh, so I would say in no society can, uh, can such, a, such a project be successful when democracy is pressed on a society from above. I would say, okay, we have some successful such democratization processes after 1945, but we know the historical roots why these processes could be successful at that time. On the other hand, uh, I'm quietly sure that the, de the democracy which shall be promoted and, uh, and uh, I would say even as a benchmark from time to time uh, asked whether it's fulfilled within the European Union should be sure the Western model of liberal democracy. So when, uh, if you allow me to move your question in, in some other direction, when the question would be whether, whether how can we, we really benchmark that these democratic breakdowns I mentioned are not democratic anymore or not democratic enough anymore, then I think, yeah, it's clear. Because uh, we have, or our ancestors have laid down in the second article of the Treaty on the European Union the principles on which the European Union is based. And these principles do not only state democracy, democracy in a majoritarian sense. Uh, they also state that this democracy should be a constitutional democracy, not in the sense that it's a written constitution, so to avoid this question, in the sense that there exists a rule of law and human rights are safeguarded. So within the European Union, only a liberal democracy is imaginable. And if it is not a liberal democracy, then I think at least on the very, very, very soft level of, uh, of public and cultural diplomacy, some, some uh, steps have to be made to, to correct wrong development paths. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned before the practical side of, uh, let's say, cultural diplomacy. And how do you believe the relationship between Germany and the Eastern Central European countries can be strengthened? That is, in a practical, from a practical point of view, what do you think Germany and these countries can do to strengthen their reports and to high, I mean, have a closer relationship? Uh, thank you very much. 
I do not, do not have a clear answer, but perhaps can explain a bit more the phenomenon. A uh, colleague of mine, who are a bit more involved in German foreign policy making and economic consultancy, etc., are often complaining uh, that the earlier existing networks, which were established in Russia, in Belarus, in the Ukraine, or in any other country currently in the scope of these democracy building projects, vanished. And they do not have partners like they earlier have had with whom they could work. And I find this phenomenon very, very, very surprising under circumstances when hundreds of uh, scholarships are shared among very young, very talented and very motivated citizens of these countries from Germany and they participate in different German cultural diplomacy projects. So I would say, and that was my point, that the networks exist. Only somehow the way shall be found to use them and to utilize them. And, and for example, really not to be here for a half year or one, but be involved in really long-standing common projects and permanent communication networks, like how, for example, I do not like the phenomenon of elites in any kind of form. But when it's so often spoken about the networks of elites and, uh, and is supported by, by a lot of money, then why do these networks not function properly? Especially if it would be in the interest of that party, which affords a lot of money for that purposes. And I think even the participants of, uh, of these courses and projects would be very happy if they wouldn't be forgotten after a year and only receiving an email about an alumni meeting, but, uh, but be involved in professional networks which are focusing on their country, anyhow, whether from an economic perspective concerning investments or the promoting of human rights and so on. So I am not an expert in this field, but from my very general uh, scope, I think it would be necessary.